Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Guys, do do y'all still have snow on the ground where you're at? I bet Brian has a whole lot more than me, but we still have a very little bit. Yeah, our kids still haven't gone back to school. Snow's on the road. Wow. Um, we, we actually had snow, and then we had sleet and ice on top of the snow. Yeah. And so, hey, guys, I actually confess, we went out to go sledding on the hill in my backyard, and I, I thought it'd be cute for Denise and I to go down the hill and let the girls video it. So we get in the sled together. We're headed down the hill and uh, <laughs> the sled, it was one of those disc plastic sleds. It curved sideways. And when it did, my my fat body made the edge of the sled dig into the snow. And so it threw us down the hill, ended up hurting Denise's neck. She's laying in the snow. Oh, no. Oh, no. Furious at me. It, it, I thought it would be cute, but it didn't end well. Please tell me there's a video of that, though. Yes, there is. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Was, JC, you and I think exactly <laughs> the same. I was going to say, Brian, I am so sorry that happened. I'm so sorry Denise is hurt, but where can I watch the video? <laughs> you got to share that with us. You have to. I promise I won't share it without your permission. Yeah. <laughs> Man, we got no snow down here. In fact, we're, we're in our couple weeks of winter here in South Georgia. Um, I think the high the next couple of weeks doesn't get above 52. So everybody's freaking out thinking we got to leave water dripping. I'm like, it's fifties y'all. Like, it's supposed <laughs> to get We have, we have four nights here in a couple of weeks where it's supposed to get down to the twenties and everybody's worried about their pipes busting. I'm like, I love South Georgia. It just doesn't get cold down here, man. That sounds like heaven. Yeah. We had a great time this week. I know Nate, you were racing home to get there before the snow. And I knew some people were saying that it wasn't going to be that bad in South Carolina, but Nate uh, was with us this past weekend at our college retreat and spoke for that man, did an absolute incredible job talking about fear and uh, how God is with us. And, you know, just, just did an incredible job and took off that night. What time did you get home? About 1145. And that didn't take as long as I thought. No, nah, it was it was about three and a half hours, and it it, had, it was raining the whole way, yeah. raining the whole way there. And I think right uh, probably twelve thirty one o'clock, it started turning to snow. As I was That's going awesome. to sleep, I woke up and we had about four inches, which is a big deal for Anderson, oh, South yeah. Carolina. Yeah, I mean definitely. a huge deal. And then uh, it it snowed more throughout the day. As the day went on, that's and awesome. we ended up with it, at least six inches in our yard. And I wow. mean, it was it was awesome. There were a couple miles down the road the other direction. They got very little. And huh. then uh, at Traveler's Rest, which is about, I don't know, 45 minutes, hour, an hour from my house, mm -hmm. uh, up toward North Carolina, they had, uh, I heard, 19 inches. It, it's, it's up Good in the wow. mountains. And it just got, they got covered up. Man, that brings everything to a screeching halt in Anderson. Yeah, it does. yeah, in South Carolina, it sure does. I got my fill of snow when we lived out in Salt Lake City, Utah. I mean, I remember the very first day that we got a good snow. I woke up that morning. I mean, it snowed like a foot overnight. And in Utah, it just falls straight down. It is the nicest snow you've ever seen. And I told him, I was like, well, it snowed a foot. There ain't no way we're getting out of this house. And I hear the school bus in front of our house. And I was like, <laughs> what are they doing? They can't even see the road. How in the world are we supposed to get there? It was like 11 o'clock and the pastor called. He's like, hey, bud, you coming to work? And I was like, where am I at? Like, what is this place? And I look like Ray Charles in a bumper car for three years trying to figure out how to drive around there. But, man, we made it work. And I'm telling you, driving on the interstate when you can't see the lanes, it just – it was normal. I mean, we learned how to drive in snow, but I am, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of snow. So I'm just happy yeah. to be in the South where we got well, cotton. That's only white that we need down here. <laughs> well, I'm jealous of you living in, this, in South Georgia once and for all, by the way, you said your cough was gone, but I don't believe it is, but, um, my bad. I'm jealous of, of you for one reason. What's that? Not, not far from you. There's this country buffet restaurant called Izola's. And what? They're, yeah, they're advertising on social media. And the other day they were going down the buffet. It's in Hinesville, Georgia. Yeah. They were going down the buffet and it was like chicken and dumplings, fried chicken, fried fish, 
um, all these other like amazing things. And the food looks about as good as it could possibly be. And so I, I said, you know, I love places like that. I'm going to drive to Georgia. And then I look it up and it's on your side of Georgia. And I'm like, man, man, JC, that's only 40 minutes away from me. Whoa. Your boy's about to go to Hinesville, Georgia. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm going to be mad jealous. I'm just telling I'll you. I'll send you some pictures. Isolas. That's interesting. Yes. Brian right. Edwards has a ton of redeeming qualities, but one of the top of his list is he knows where every good restaurant is at within 5,000 miles. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't matter what state we mention. He knows he 12 knows good buffet. restaurants there, <laughs> yeah. and most of them he's eaten at. So that's just like, Brian, man, that's next level, bro. Somebody told me a while back that they wish I'd kept like an online or a diary of all the places I've been to eat because – I've been to so many amazing places and I can't remember them now, but a little while back, I even had somebody tell me that they were going to be outside of Anchorage, Alaska. And I told them that they had to go to Gwynny's old Alaskan restaurant for <laughs> breakfast. It's the best bacon I've ever eaten. And then they need to go to this little town outside of Anchorage called Talkeetna because they actually have guys check this out. They make everything in house. They bake the bread fresh. They get the halibut straight from the ocean that morning. Unreal. And then they grill a halibut sandwich. Oh, man. Mm. That sounds amazing. Brian, wanna, you know I'm still on a diet, trail. right? You know I'm still <laughs> dieting. And, uh, man, I am I had a very small dinner. And this this uh, unsweetened coffee is is holding me over. But you're making me very hungry. I'm hey, taking my bread with my teeth. Eat. You can eat one. <laughs> what did you, you say, can, Brian? <laughs> I said I'm digging my grave with my teeth. <laughs> That's what I thought you said, but Aren't I'm like, we are wrong. <laughs> oh, dude, I love it. Oh boy. Well, today we are back into our topic that we started before the little December sabbatical to taboo topics. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited about today's conversation. Uh, we're going to be talking about the topic of homosexuality. And uh, so I think we should just go ahead and jump right into today's episode. Y'all ready? I'm, I'm ready. ready. Let's go. Covering Fundamentalist Podcast begins in three. These podcasts, <laughs> podcasts, that sounds like a convention of beans or peas to me. I, podcast. Listen, in these recovering fundamentalists, they don't know the Bible either. What are the fundamentals? Inerrancy, virgin birth of Jesus Christ, Amen. substitutionary atonement, Amen. bodily resurrection Amen. of Christ, and the authenticity of miracles. Hi, man. Two. I am not a recovering fundamentalist. They're everywhere. They're all over the internet. They want to be, uh, what do they call it? Recovering from fundamentalism. They're everywhere. And I think to myself, well, you were just stupid to begin with. And if there's such a word, you're stupider now. We well, ain't recovering from nothing good, neighbor. We're reviving from the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, man, rock Everybody wants to focus on recovering. Oh, you're recovering. Oh, you need yeah. help. You need therapy. You're recovering. Let's focus on fundamentalists. We're recovering fundamentalism back from people who have hijacked it. We are biblical Phew. family. We are the fundamentalists. Man, that'll make a Baptist want to speak in tongues right there, boys. One. I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, we better stay uh, in the old paths. Uh, but what are the old paths? I, I've, I've heard that my whole life, and nobody's ever been able to tell me what the old paths or the old time religion really is because it's whatever era you mm -hmm. overly romanticize in your mind as being when the church was it, right. Mm. Like it, lump it, pump it, chump it, take it across the street and dump it. We've raised a generation that is ashamed of our forefathers and act like they were somehow done wrong in the way they were brought up and they were damaged and they were scarred because they were raised in a home that had standards and convictions and kept them on the old time way. You got their number, boys. Y'all thought you started the podcast. You went and started the movement.
Thanks for joining us for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Make sure to stay tuned at the end of the show to hear more about the RFP sponsors. Now, here's your host for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast, Nathan Cravat, J.C. Groves, and Brian Edwards. Well, hey, everybody. We're so glad you're here with us again on the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We're getting closer to episode 100. And uh, thanks for being here with us. It's crazy to believe that a lot of y'all have been here through all of these episodes, but we are uh, so excited uh, for where we're going. And uh, it's been an incredible journey here. And uh, we thank our sponsors uh, for being part of the RFP. And uh, we have some new sponsors that are coming on board and uh, they're going through the process right now. Um, If you would like to be a sponsor of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast, you can go to the recoveringfundamentalist.org and there's a sponsor tab there and I fill out that application and we'll get back to you. And uh, man, it's, it's, it's exciting to see the, the, uh, the folks that have responded from what we talked about last week. And uh, I'm excited to, to see where, where it goes. Yeah. And we also want to say thank you to our patrons that uh, have, have helped us out so much. And, and if you're interested in being a patron, if you believe in what we're doing, we invite you to go do that. And man, th- those guys have made meetups possible. They, yeah. They've done so much for, for this podcast and enabled us to do what God's called us to do. They're consistent. That's what yep. I love about the patrons. And yep. and there is monthly overhead that would be coming out of our pocket that we don't yep. have that, you know, with the web hosting and uh, the RFP network hosting. And there's a lot of, a uh, lot of, a lot of just little things here and there that are adding up and the patrons, man, they keep us afloat every yep. single month. And so we thank them. And like always, we thank Justin Knight for all of his incredible work behind the scenes. Guys, well, you know, a few years. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say real quick, Nathan said, you know, he thanked the Patreons for supporting the podcast. But really, guys, if you think about it, it's because of the Patreons that the podcast has been more than that. It's actually been a ministry. Because yeah. all the ministry opportunities we've had have been the result of the patrons. Yeah, straight up. Straight that's up. That's awesome. You know, a couple of years ago, that's hard to believe that we're even saying that. A couple of years ago, we had a gentleman on the podcast. It was one of our first guests that we had on. Uh, we asked the question very bluntly. If a homosexual were to walk into your church, would you present the gospel to them? And very boldly and quickly, uh, he responded, no, I would kick them out. I would tell Mm -hmm. them they're not welcome here. And I watched as all three of us in disbelief, uh, just, I mean, my heart broke in that moment to just think that he thought he was doing right by kicking that person out of his church and not allowing them to be there and not presenting the gospel to them. And, and, uh, that's not where we stand at no. all. Um, but today we want to talk about um, homosexuality as we're in this series that we've been in for a while, if you will, called Taboo Topics. And Nathan, where, where are we going today? Set the stage for us. So this is a, a really important topic. And I thought it was funny that that no one has ever attacked us on this. You know, we've been attacked on just about everything. And this is a spot that you would think our haters would come after us on and accuse us of being some ultra liberals on this yeah. or compromisers, but I don't even think we've received that. And I think part of the reason is every time something came up like it did in that episode you're referencing, uh, we, we've given little tidbits and little hints, but we have never made a clear statement on this. And uh, if anybody's wondering why, it's been intentional because since the very beginning, we've been planning on doing an episode on this, because this is one of the areas that we believe the independent fundamental Baptists, many of them, butcher. They absolutely butcher this, and they fall off into a ditch on one side of the road, Yeah, and uh, then there are other people out there that are in the other ditch. So before we get to homosexuality, before we get to that topic, we want to say that every single human being that has walked the face of this earth that is alive now or that has died already, every single human being is created in the image of God. They bear God's, God's image. They're image bearers of our creator. And in that alone, they possess dignity, value, and worth, and they deserve our respect. We don't think that any human being, no matter how 
wrong, no matter how sinful, no matter what lifestyle they're in, should be bullied, should be mocked, made fun of from a pulpit. Now, there's a time to mock and make fun of sin, I think, and, and call out sin. But when you mock and make fun of people, human beings that bear God's image, instead of calling them to repentance and sharing the gospel with them, that is blatant, open sin that does not reflect the heart of God. So I just wanted us to start off by saying every human being, even people that disagree with me about theology, even people that don't believe in God, atheists deserve our respect, and they deserve to be treated with human decency and dignity. Yeah, you know, our position is this. Hate speech just will not be tolerated. As a matter of fact, hate speech doesn't lead a person to repentance. The love of God leads a person to repentance. We love him Amen. Because he first loved us. When we yeah. first love people with the love of Christ, I believe, guys, that creates the possibility of other people being open to loving him yeah. in return. And so we just can't tolerate any any negative language that would be hateful or hate-filled. Um, as a matter of fact, I think we come together as believers in a church setting, whether that's in a small group or that's in the auditorium, I think we come together for the purpose of equipping Christians to reach people who don't have a relationship with God. Yeah, That's our mission. So if we start, um, I guess, openly condemning with hate-filled language people who don't have a relationship with God, what we're saying is yeah. there's a demographic of the mission field that we have no desire to reach. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest. There are people who struggle with homosexuality sitting in your church. Yeah. There are people that you see almost every day that are struggling with homosexuality. And uh, I think too many times the church does a bad job of being Jesus to these people. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we can give some good insight and also some some biblical views on how to yeah. talk about this subject for sure. Yeah, I don't believe any sinner is too far from the reach of God's grace. God no, can sir. save Not at all. anyone. He could save a murderer. Amen. He, he can and has and will save homosexuals. He can, he has, and he will save heterosexuals who cheat on their wives all the time and run around and uh, many of them do it while they're standing in pulpits preaching against homosexuals. And uh, so I, I want to say that we we do believe that the power of God's grace is scandalous, and yeah. he can save the, the, the worst of sinners. I think we'd be shocked how many actually struggle with this sin yeah. that are standing in the pulpits. I, my papa used to always say, you preach on what you struggle with the most. How many, yeah. <laughs> how many guys are talking about skinny jeans and homosexuality and little boy cut haircuts and I mean, hello. Yeah. You may be a red flag, more red flags in Panama city during a hurricane. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a girl uh, that I, I love her story. Her name is Jackie Lee Hill Perry. And uh, Nate, have you, did you get to hear her at Passion? Yes, yes I did. She did an incredible Man, job. She, she spoke on the holiness of God and it, it was oh, basically so from her, from her mm -hmm. new book. And uh, that's actually on my list to read this year. Yeah, there's a there's an article that I read a while back. I can't remember how long ago. I've had it saved, knowing that we were going to talk about this someday. It was on Christianity Today, and she goes through there and talks about how um, while she was still living as a lesbian from the time she was young, uh, she said homosexuality might have been my loudest sin, mm. but it was not my only sin. And God was not about setting me free from one form of slavery, slavery only to leave me enslaved by other idols. By calling me to himself, he was after my whole heart. His intention was to turn it towards him and to transform it only as he could, enabling me to be holy in how I express my sexuality and everything else. When God saves, he saves holistically. So my repentant would not be singular. And the night that I gave my life to Jesus, I knew it wasn't just my lesbianism that had me at odds with God, but it was my entire heart. 
And uh, she goes on to talk about how uh, she had to give that up and how, uh, you know, she still, and this is something that I'd love for us to get into. She still, still had an attraction, a same sex attraction, but she didn't act out on it. Um, and she said, you know, now she's married, has a baby, um, you know, with a, with a gentleman. Um, but she said, I had no idea uh, what would come next or how I uh, have the power to resist everything I'd once lived for. But I knew that if Jesus was God and if God was mighty to save, then surely God would be mighty to keep. And all of these years later, he's still keeping this girl godly. And she said, I just got to live for God now. And with brokenness in her voice, her new identity was coming up. And she said, my identity is now in not my sexual identity, but in who God is. Yeah. And I think that that lends a question, something that we were talking about kind of before uh, we jumped on here, you know, is is same sex attraction a sin or not a sin? Is being tempted a sin or is it not a sin? I'm interested to see what what y'all thoughts are on that. I would start off by saying I don't believe temptation is a sin. I, I think uh, it comes from sure. a fallen world. It comes from mm -hmm. our enemy. It comes from a sinful place. But I am not sinning when I'm tempted. For example, I was I was brought into uh, sexual sin as a very, very young boy. I'm talking as an eight-year-old boy. I, I was exposed to sin, sexual right. sin. Uh, not too many years later, was exposed to pornography and struggled with it my entire life from that point on. And I can tell you today, I am still tempted to sin sexually. There are some of those skeletons in our closet that, that uh, never go away. That that desire for things that that are wrong and that are sinful, that are forbidden. And when I'm tempted to sin, I don't believe that I'm sinning. I and I've even heard that preached my whole life in independent Baptist churches. That is, it's like a a bird that's <laughs> circling around your head. Uh, you don't let it make a nest in your hair, but uh, just because it's flying over you doesn't mean that that's necessarily. A sin. So our enemy is attacking us. The Bible said our enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. So this world is dangling the bait and the temptation out in front of mm -hmm. me. The devil is luring me and, and tempting me to take that, and my flesh wants that. Sure. But that is where we have to give into the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think we've all prayed that God would free us from the temptation to sin. Like I, I prayed for years, God free me from the desire to look at pornography. And God frankly never did that. And I think one of the reasons is because I need to depend upon him every mm -hmm. day to, to be my true desire, to be my greater desire and to rescue me from temptation. And every time I come to him and pray, every time I surrender to him, that is a, that is an act of grace and an act of obedient, an act of obedience on my part, and grace on his part. So I would just have to say, from my perspective, having same-sex attraction is not a sin in and of itself. Giving into yeah. that would be sin. So when JC first, you know, before we started recording, JC made this statement. He was reading from a quote, and he said, "You know, same-sex attraction is not a sin until acted on." And to tell you the truth, JC, when I heard you say that. I just had to check up for just a second because, you know, mm -hmm. when you have theological conversations with people constantly, sure, you know, you develop a framework. And so, you know, when something is new, it's a new perspective, it's a new right. angle. So when I heard you say that, but to be honest, as Nathan's talking, I've been thinking more about it. And, you know, the Bible says there is no temptation mm -hmm. that has taken you, but such as is common to right. man. Yeah. So every temptation regarding every sin on some level would be common to man. For one person, it might be sexual sin with a person of the same sex. For another person, yeah. it might be a sexual attraction for a person of the opposite sex. But both mm -hmm. are sinful sexual desire. And and I think how you finish that your statement up just now, the verse kind of you know coincides with what you said. But with every temptation, God makes a way yeah. of escape. So I would say this. I believe, I believe temptation becomes a sin when we dwell on the temptation 
Mm. so that we mentally start making provisions for our flesh to live into the temptation. Yeah. But just I think, struggling sorry, with temptation. Go ahead. No, just struggling with temptation. Yeah. That's common to man. Sure. I think to be human is to have a disordered sexuality in some way. You do, I do, everyone does, because we all have some manner of sexual drive that compels us in that sin nature to disobey God's design for sexuality. Sin is there. There's that temptation there. I think sexual sin is giving into the desire in either mind or body and faithful Christians, those who follow Jesus, cannot avoid temptation, but we strive to resist it and master it with God's help. And I think in doing so, um, the obedience and dependence on Christ, I think many are in same-sex attracted, uh, but they live obediently within a Christian sexual ethic, if you will, um, mm -hmm. that it can be difficult. But just like it is for heterosexuals who are required to live in celibacy, Christians require, Christianity requires that we eat, subject our sexual and many other things, food, substance, you know, mm -hmm. relationships to our faith commitment. And I, I know countless same sex attracted believers who do so willfully and joyfully. And um, there's a young lady named Carissa um, that we brought into college nights a few weeks ago, uh, who for 13 years of her life was LGBTQ, uh, same sex, um, trans, non-binary. Uh, you know, she, she shared her story. She was working it at a church in New York that, um, you know, she was leading the choir and they wanted that kind of people in there. And man, she bumped into Jesus on the uh, subway and realized that this is not the way that I'm supposed to live. But she said, I was still trying to live that life, but I was miserable. And she mm. said, you know, when Jesus comes in, there's a newness that comes. You can still have the desire to do all these old things that you could do, but you just can't anymore because there's a new person living inside of this old person. And she said, I couldn't do the same things I wanted to. And I, I think it's just like a heterosexual when it comes to the opposite sex or a homosexual with the same sex. The attraction is not the sin. The temptation to be attracted to that person is not the sin. I believe it's the acting on that attraction yeah. is where the sin is. Yeah. And I, I think that brings up another topic. Uh, and this is a very controversial topic. And I, I would almost think we may have different views on this. Uh, we didn't talk about this before, so we're just going to jump off this cliff. Um, Here we go. Th there are a lot of people that just blame their sexuality on saying, well, I was born that way. Mm. And I, I want to speak into that because, one, I don't believe being born that way is an excuse to sin. No. But I do want to say I believe, and this may shock some people, because I'm pretty conservative. I believe that every human being is born predisposed and bent toward different types of sin. JC, mm -hmm. I think you were born with, with, with certain things that attracted you that probably wouldn't have attracted me. And I was born with things. I'll just be honest. I was born with, with an attraction towards fighting. I, I loved fighting uh, the, yeah. we had a history of crime in my family. And I used hmm. to, as a child daydream about committing crimes and then ended up becoming a kleptomaniac and would steal stuff everywhere I went until my yes. dad took care of that. Uh, when I finally got caught and got in trouble big time, but <laughs> those, those things in just little kids, there are mm -hmm. things that, that we're predisposed to different types of sin. Now, is sure. that an excuse to, for me to say, you know what, I just like to fight. So it's okay for me to beat people up or I was born angry. So it's okay for me to murder someone. No, mm -hmm. it's not saying that, but I think all human, all Christians would have to admit that all humans are born with predispositions towards different sins. We wouldn't have a problem saying that any other sin, maybe, maybe they were born with that. The sins of the fathers being passed down generational sins, but then we kind of balk when we get to homosexuality. Yeah. Well, you know, I think this comes down to God's creative order. Yeah. Ultimately, it's putting God's creative order on trial. And, you know, Genesis chapter one, God created male and female. Genesis chapter two, God created male and female, male for female, 
female for male. The Bible says male and female made he them. King James there for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's ultimately about God's creative order. How did God design us? And are we obediently going to live within God's design? An extension of that would be to say that God created one man, Adam, for one woman, Eve. Yeah. And so anything outside of that, whether heterosexual or homosexual, is against God's creative design. And so it comes down to, you know, people make this statement all the time, and uh, by the way, guys, we've allowed the narrative to be taken away from us. The mm -hmm. church's unwillingness to have good, coherent conversations about the issues of the day has cost us losing the narrative. And now, you know, politics has waded in, not into the business of policy, but they've waded into the business of morality. And now everything from our sexuality to who we marry, everything now is, has become a political subject. And so it's been flipped on its ear politically. And we say, well, you were created like this. You were born like this, live into it, indulge it. Yeah. But as men, we were created to be attracted to women. Does that make living into our, our lustful desires? I agree with multiple women. Does that make it right? No, we no, all it doesn't. have to live within the confines of God's creative order to be yep. right with God. You're right. Yep. But I think we have to admit that we live in a fallen world. Definitely. Christians believe that. That's the orthodox Christian position. And in this fallen world, we are affected. Every aspect of God's creation has been affected by sin. That doesn't mean we have an excuse when we fall into sin. Exactly what you're saying, Brian. And I do think that culture and society plays a part in this. If you're mm -hmm. raised in a home where that is glorified, if you're raised watching media where that's the new cool thing, they say that in high schools and middle schools now, that is that is the surest and fastest way to being cool is to say you're gay. That is the mm. opposite of when we were in high school yep. and, and middle school. And now mm -hmm. that is like the one trump card that everybody can play. Oh, oh, I'm gay. And then, oh, they're just they're just cool now. And I think our culture does play into that through through media, through yeah. trends, through music, through movies, all that different stuff, and through abuse. We know that people that have been abused, people that have mm. been didn't have a positive father figure or mother figure in their life, things like that play into their environmental uh, experience. But I do think that we're all born with different aspects, bent towards different sin. That's sure. not an excuse to sin. That's just the reality we live in. I think it definitely evolves around cultural norms. Yeah. I mean, in, in the worlds that we live in, I mean, we're college and student pastors. I mean, it, it is homosexuality is almost kind of a, not even a taboo topic because it's such a cultural norm now. It's just the, now you're getting into gender they, them, he, she, you know, pronouns. It's it's almost like homosexuality, that same sex attraction in certain ways is the, is the gateway that opens up to so many more things, trans um, identity, you know, but it all comes back to identity. And then there's, there's just so many more other things that it opens up to, but I think it all stems from cultural. I mean, it, it, it's accepted. It, it is the, the cool thing. You know I mean? We used to, we used to joke around all the time and say, Oh, that's gay. You know I mean? That, that was the joke when we were all kids and we've all said that at certain points. Now, you know, there's a point where that's not even accepted. And you know, it, because now when you look at it, the cultural norm is, Oh yes, I am gay, but there's all these other things that follow after that. And it's yeah. kind of like, there's, that's just the front if you will, for a whole truckload of stuff that follows behind it. Yeah. And that's what happens when you get outside of God's exactly beyond his boundaries. Where does it stop? You know, you know, God is a, a brilliant designer and the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. When you look at our anatomical design, it's obvious that male was created for female and female was created for male, e you know, without being crass, the way the male body and the female body functions together and both were designed in a way that would make them compatible um, in sexuality. All of those things reflect God's creative order. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I think anytime you go outside of the boundaries of God's creative order, again, whether that be pornography, um, whether that be 
relationships with other people. Um, even, even as was mentioned <clears throat> recently, when, when you become, um, was it asexual that the guy actually mentioned it, or, you know, different things. I, I forget the exact term he used. This covers a broad spectrum of things. Yeah. Mm. Which, which gets us to the, the point where I think we've kind of danced around this. Let's, let's get down to what everybody really needs to hear us say, because I think there are people on both sides of this issue that, uh, you know, whichever ditch they're in, some of the stuff we're saying, they're like, yeah, yeah, I like that. I like the, the human dignity part. And then other people are liking things that we're saying about being created in God's created, creative order. And they're like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. But let's answer this question. Let's just go around one by one. JC, is homosexuality a sin? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would echo that. Yes, according to the Bible, homosexuality is a sin. And I know both of you guys can speak into this. I just <laughs> want to say one thing about it. If you can explain homosexuality away using the Bible, saying it's not a sin, you can explain everything away. Mm -hmm. You yes. can't say murder is a sin. You can't say pedophilia is a sin. You can't say anything is a sin. If you can take a Bible, reading it, and, and try to explain away, God is absolutely clear that homosexuality is sexual sin. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've really been offended recently because, you know, there are a lot of denominations now and then the unitarian uh mm. I, I i can't call it a church but yeah um you know they're ordaining uh people who are openly homosexual openly lesbian mm -hmm. and you know some of those people now are are building large social media platforms and it keeps going further and further and further and I actually heard a clip this past week where a gay pastor made the statement that if you are homosexual, God has given you a gift, not, not just saying God allows it, but now it's being glorified. And then one of the most prominent social media gay pastors recently made the statement, um, that Jesus was a homosexual, mm. that when you look at his relationship with his disciples and that he didn't have a relationship with a woman. And so if you think about it, we live in an over-sexualized culture where now we're so over-sexualized that everything is seen through a sexual lens. You're now known by your sexual identity. That becomes your category. Guys, this is a frightening way to live. Yeah. This is a frightening road. And so here's, here's my position on it. I'm going to love any and every single center that of every single kind that comes into my path, knowing apart from the grace of God that I would be lost and eternally on my way to hell. At the same time, compromising God's word is not an option because the mm -hmm. moment you compromise God's word, you are in effect apologizing for what the God of the universe said. And I say this frequently, I don't write the mail. I deliver the mail. Yeah. If you don't like the mail, your issue's not with me. Your issue's with the author of the mail. Yeah. That's good. In her book, The Secret, uh, let me get this. The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Con The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert by Rosaria Butterfield. I don't know if you guys have read this or heard her speak. She was um a very prominent, one of the most prominent lesbian uh, professors at a very prominent uh, Syracuse University. And uh, she was tenured and was teaching, was, was in a lesbian relationship and teaching and uh, lecturing on that topic. And it was in the middle of that, that she started being witnessed to by her neighbors. And she was originally just curious and, uh, her old Presbyterian neighbors, an old couple started invited her over, inviting her over and feeding her dinner and just sharing the gospel with her. And in the beginning, she just, you know, looked down on them and thought whatever, but they were kind to her. So she started listening and God started convicting her heart 
through the gospel that was verbalized by this pastor and his wife. And I think she gets to the point of why uh, homosexuality is so dangerous, because there is some aspect of homosexuality that is twisting God's created order and mm -hmm. God's will in a way that heterosexual sin does not. Heterosexual mm -hmm. sin is sinful, and it's egregious, and it will be sure. judged by God. But there is an aspect of twisting uh, sexuality outside of its purpose. Uh, right. hetero heterosexual sinners are at least using sex within the purpose that was created for a man and a woman. Again, they're not justified in that. They're not any better than homosexuals. There's just an aspect. And she she's addressing Ezekiel 16, where God is talking about the sin in Sodom. And this is what she says. God tells us what is at the root of homosexuality and what the progression of sin is. We read here that the root of homosexuality is also the root of a myriad of other sins. First, we find pride. Sodom and her daughters had pride. Why pride? Because pride is at the root of all sin. And I've said this before, but I think it's a point that, that deserves to be repeated. I have never met someone who was drunk, who was stumbling through the streets, who looked at me and said, what I'm doing is not wrong. I'm proud of what I'm doing. No, almost every drunk I've ever encountered has looked at me and said, I know what I'm doing is wrong. I know what I'm doing is sinful. Uh, I've, I've witnessed to murderers. I've, I've witnessed to rapists in prison. I've, I've even led some of them to the Lord. I'm talking some of the most hardened gangsters in jails and prisons shared the gospel with them, and they would admit openly, I've always known this was sin. I've never tried to justify it. I just loved my sin. But when you start saying it's not a sin, what I'm doing isn't wrong, that removes you from the possibility of repentance, which removes you from the possibility of salvation, because mm -hmm. we have to agree with God about our sin. We have to confess our sin. We have to repent of our sin and trust in Christ. Now, I, I feel like I need to tell some of our listeners that repentance isn't being perfect. It doesn't mean you clean your life up. It just means a, a, a change of heart that leads to a change of action. It's agreeing with God that this is a sin and that I, I desire him more than I desire my sin, and I want him to change me, and you call on him to be your savior. But when you say this is not a sin and you continue in your sin, that's that's not the road to salvation. So when she talks about pride being the anchor, what is the key word for, for the homosexual movement? It's mm -hmm. the pride movement. It's mm -hmm. the pride flag. It's pride parades. And they are trying to say that this is not sin. And every homosexual that I've encountered that has come to faith in Christ has had to ha has admitted that God convicted them of their sin. And they confessed their sin, they repented, and God saved them, and he changed their heart. Mm. You know, I actually had that Ezekiel 16 passage um, pulled up to, to, to discuss because the Bible says, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, abundance of food, and abundance of idleness. Mm. Neither did she strengthen strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Mm. You know, how many times did you and I guys sit through services where some guy screamed that Sodom was destroyed because of, you know, all the Sodomites. And I've heard, man, I've heard such crude language and, and words used behind a pulpit. And it was excused because they were talking about this specific group of people. Do you know I never heard Ezekiel 16? Yeah. I never heard that they had pride. I never heard that they had fullness of food. I never heard that they were idle. I never heard that, you know, any of those other things that they didn't care for the poor. And guys, I've got to be honest. And this is going to really offend somebody. But the movement I grew up in, they actually glamorized obesity. Pastors would make jokes 
yep. about their obesity after services. You would go and eat tons of food. And then what would they do? Lay in hotel rooms and all go and play golf the next day and, and be idle. I never, ever saw us go out and serve the poor. Hmm. I never had anybody disciple for me serving poor people, feeding the poor in our community, laboring among the poor. Never. Hmm. Ezekiel 16 was never mentioned. Yeah. But the fact is God didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because there were homosexuals there. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because there were a lack of righteous people there. Yeah. Homosexuality was only the result of their sinful indulgence and their unrighteousness and their living away from God. America's not sinful because we have now a large homosexual population. No, we're sinful before this. This is where the road leads. Mm. Yeah, uh, this this same uh, lady, Rosaria Butterfield, um, and I would recommend everybody to read her books, man. She is as solid and as strong on this topic as, as anyone, but she makes the point that homosexuality is not the root sin, that it's just a, a consequence mm-hmm. of other sins. And again, getting back to this idea of pride, when you give into sin, Jesus says you become a slave to that sin. You don't know where that sin's going to drag you. When, when that when that eight year old kid starts looking at pornography, he mm-hmm. has no idea that one day he's going to be a grown man molesting a child because his his sexuality has dragged him. His, his sin has dragged him to that link. And and I've seen guys weep and cry and say, "I never dreamed I would do this," but you become a slave to sin. But I think it's a good time to say that homosexuality is a sin against God. The Bible says it's a sin against your own body. Any sexual sin is, and it's an especially uh, damaging sin that has consequences that other sins don't have. You know, telling lies doesn't lead you into a lifestyle that exposes you to AIDS. Uh, Heterosexual and homosexual sin does. It, it, It exposes you to STDs. So different sin, while I guess you could say in one sense it's equal before God, they have different consequences. So, uh, but but sin is not the unfor homosexuality is not the unforgivable sin. It's not mm-hmm. the worst sin. In this same passage in Ezekiel, if you go study it in context, he is God. God is telling Jerusalem that they are worse than Samaria and they are worse than Sodom. Hmm. try that on for size bet you never heard that preached in an independent baptist pulpit or a baptist pulpit at all because jesus god was speaking to his people saying that you've done worse than they did Hmm. so what is worse than homosexuality well one thing that's worse than homosexuality is possessing the truth and not living and believing Hmm. it and and sharing it with others and and walking in truth so so uh, again, it, everything kind of comes back to reading the Bible in context, doesn't it? Hello. Well, guys, <laughs> listen, listen to these statistics. 2% of sexual activity in our nation is homosexual. And yet 61% of HIV is due to homosexuality. Mm-hmm. Meth addiction is 20 times higher among homosexuals. Obesity, drug abuse, depression, and alcoholism is significantly higher among homosexuals, 32 to 37% of homosexuals admit to being sexually abused. Homosexuals are six times more likely to commit suicide. Domestic abuse is twice the national average, as well as an increased risk of certain cancers and lower life expectancy among homosexuals. The American Medical Society reports that high percentages of homosexual men develop intestinal disease due to parasites, as well as the majority of hepatitis cases in America and a leading gay publication did a survey and listen to what their results revealed sometime back that the average gay man has between 100 and 500 Mm -hmm. sexual partners over a lifetime with 28% reporting to this survey done by a gay magazine that they had more than 1000 sexual partners and more than 79% reported 
that the majority of those were strangers. Mm. Yeah. How can we know that people are living in that kind of bondage and not care for them? Yeah. Mm. A little while back, um, I had an older gay man stop by the church office unexpectedly. I think he had a family member that once attended. And so it was the only place he knew to go. He came and he sat down in my office and he started when he was a child and he told the story of sexual abuse by a man that he looked up to. He told about the horrors of his life, living the lifestyle that he had lived, the places that had taken him, the things that it had driven him to do. And guys, at the end of that, that man broke down and cried like a baby. And I, he actually opened his arms because he wanted me to hug him. You know what I did? I wrapped my arms around him. Hmm. He wept on my shoulder. And I prayed with him that he would find true deliverance and freedom in Jesus Christ. Hmm. I couldn't say to him, I'm not hugging you. I'm not touching yeah. you. I'm not. Hmm. That's that's not right. That, that doesn't even reflect the image of Christ hmm. as we see him in the Gospels at all. And and to be honest, anytime we preach against any sin, we should never preach against sin arrogantly. Mm -mm. We should always preach against sin with a broken heart. Yeah. Because first of all, knowing our own sinful tendencies and then knowing the consequences, the eternal consequences of sin in anybody's life. When a guy's preaching on sin arrogantly, you're not listening to a preacher. You're listening to a pig. Yeah. He's a yeah. jerk. And Jesus yeah. doesn't call jerks. Mm. He's hiding some stuff too. Mm. I think I think it's important, guys. As I'm listening to you guys talk, my, I'm I'm just sitting here and thinking about the people that are going to listen to this episode. And no doubt, there could be some folks that have lived in guilt for a very long time. Yeah. Um, maybe there's some folks that are hiding, that have struggled in this area, um, that um, feels like there's no hope and it's a cycle of depression and a cycle of uh, just a pattern of sin in their life because they mm -hmm. can't find freedom from this area, but they live alone in this. Mm -hmm. And if the news ever came out or the, the, it, the story ever broke that they were a homosexual or have homosexual tendencies, or they are attracted to that. I mean, I mean, we know men now who were married, had wives who came out of the closet that are living homosexual lives now. You know, I mean, Ray Boltz is one of those guys who was a mm. Christian singer for a long time, you know. And so I think we would be dumb to think that there are people that are listening to this that aren't struggling with that. And I I think it's important to to understand, like, giving some next steps. Like, what what is the next yeah. step? I think repentance and some accountability is very important. I yeah. think there's a... There's a owning up to it, a, a having a conversation, finding some somebody in your life that you can confide in and just be honest and real because yeah. you're never going to you're never going to beat this by yourself. Yeah. Like you're never going to be able to get over this on your own. Uh, it, it's a sin. And we've we've heard this, Brian, the, the song I'm sure we've sung, sin will take you further than you want to go cost you more than you want to pay and it'll leave you where you don't want to stay. And that happens both heterosexual and homosexuals. And there's so many people, maybe you just feel like you are lost and there is no hope. I can tell you that Corey Tin Boone said, there's no deep too deep that God is not deeper still. And I think even in the moment where you're listening to this, if this is right when this comes out or 10 years from now, and you're listening to this podcast, you don't even know why you popped on it. Um, and you're hopeless right now because the stuff, the sin in your life, the 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 guilt, um, the anger at yourself for getting to this place, the confusion, and you don't know how you ended up here. I think you need to start taking some steps and realize that the gospel is for you, yeah. that the gospel can reach you where you're at. But you have to realize that your sin and your rejection and your rebellion of him is separating you from him. Yeah. And a God who is just and holy he cannot and will not look over that rejection and that rebellion. Amen. But a God who is love and mercy, he will not leave you helpless and hopeless. And that is why he sent Jesus to step into history, yeah. to live a perfect life, to die a criminal's death, to be buried and to rise again. So you 
can have that real and eternal life that John 10, 10 talks about because the thief, he's come to steal and to kill and destroy. And he wants you to stay in that sexual mm. temptation, acting out on it, where that, that yeah. funk that you're in, but man, he came to give you life more abundantly. And you are miserable, even though you're living it up and you feel like your sin is fun. Sin is exciting. Sin, <laughs> sin, sexy. I mean, let's be honest. Sin will is attractionable. Is that is that a word? Attraction? Yeah, it's attractive. Yeah, there it is. Um, but it's down a dead end road. Yeah. And maybe what you just need to do is give Jesus the steering wheel of your life, and just say, God, I'm giving you control. I cannot do this on my own. I'm I'm gonna continue to wreck over and over and over again. And you just say, God, here I am. Here's me in an act of surrender, my sexual preference, my sexual identity, my desires, homosexual, heterosexual, whoever this is, listen, you just say, God, here I am. I need help. And I think you need to not just go through that alone. Don't just listen to this, but you got to find some folks in your world that you can confide in. Repentance is very important. Um, to, and then accountability to get out of this. I don't know. My heart is just, as I was listening to you, you two talk. I just think about who's on the other side of this podcast, mm -hmm. listening to this, who's watching this on YouTube. that just needs some hope to know that there is hope. Yeah. They're not stuck. This yeah. isn't how it has to be. There is a way. And that way is Jesus. Yeah. JC, mm -hmm. that's a powerful word, man. And, and that was, that resonates with me because I remember when I was struggling with sexual sin uh, I remember when I felt trapped. I remember when I felt bound. Here's one thing I know about everybody that's listening to us, whatever sin you struggle with, your sin is not bringing you satisfaction at all. There, at all. There's no peace. There's no joy. No. It's it destroying you. Like you said, it's a dead end road, but and the God. empty promises that you're making to God are yeah. you keep breaking those yeah. like oh, I'll not do this. If you, it's it's miserable. Yeah, it is. And you need a savior. And the gospel yeah. is the power of God to salvation. And God can save anyone. Mm -hmm. If you Anytime. think you're so far gone that you can't be saved, you're exactly who Jesus came for. Yeah. And if you think you're so good, maybe because you've never done this one sin that you don't need to be saved. Watch You're missing out. the whole point of the gospel. God came to save those who think they're righteous and don't yeah. need it, and he came to save those who think they're too far gone. They, they mm. both need Jesus equally. So call on his name today. He is mighty Amen. to save. He will rescue you if you're willing to believe the gospel and turn. And, and I pray that the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of the blind. I pray he brings the dead to life through this episode. And I think it's important to say this, though. I, my brain goes to the man that had a legion of demons. Yeah. He will do the impossible and yeah. set you free. Yes. But you got to do the possible. Yeah. You got to leave the graveyard behind. You've got to yeah. leave. That dude could have stayed in his comfortableness of the graveyard, yeah. the yeah. tombs, night and day where he was running and cutting himself with stones. But what did Jesus tell him to do? Go home. Tell your yeah. friends and family what yeah. good things the Lord have done for you. He'll set you free. That's yeah. the impossible. You've yeah. got to take the possible steps and that's leave it behind. Yeah. And that's repentance, accountability, getting some good folks in your life that will hold you, uh, you know, accountable, I think. Yeah. Hey guys, I just want to read a passage of scripture from first Timothy, mm. just based on what you guys have been saying. Now we know that the law is good. If one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, mm -hmm. for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, mm -hmm. for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him who has given me strength in Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, mm -hmm. persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I have received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love 
that are yeah. in Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to mm. save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Yeah. Mm. We can't put any sin in a category all of its own. Yeah. And we can't put any group of sinners in a category all their own. Exactly. And we can never elevate any sin beyond the reach of the grace of God. The man who wrote those words, think about this. He orchestrated the murder of Christians. Mm. He orchestrated that and then later became a Christian and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He said, God can save you. He's already saved the chief of sinners. And so he can easily save you. And uh, mm. I love that message and that truth. And, and for too long, we grew up in a denomination where um, this subject was badly abused. Yeah. And it became one of those that you could rail against and you could act and speak ignorantly. And it was accepted. And that's not the message of the gospel. Yeah. It was, it was the whipping boy at the camp meetings. Yep. It was, it was the one that, that got picked on and man, I, I never, I'll never forget. I've had this experience with somebody who had an abortion and with a homosexual, they were in a church and the preacher was preaching so hard against the sin that all that person walked out of that church thinking was that God hated them and they were damned for hell. Yeah. God they, they heard the condemnation and that, and that's a part of sharing the gospel, but they never heard the hope of the gospel that God came to save and rescue sinners. Mm. Amen. And man, God forbid that I would ever preach yeah. trying to preach so hard that I'm condemning sin and I end up condemning sinners because Jesus said mm. he came to save sinners. Amen. That's right. I think there's two takeaways from this tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is for uh, the Christian, the those of us that are listening that don't struggle with this. I think we need to check our heart and how we respond to sinners, how we respond. You know, I, I, I'm convicted, you know, to, to want to be the hands and feet of Jesus to love people like Jesus loved them. And, and, you know, recovering fundamentalists, we, we have that tendency to slip back into legalism, you know, yeah. like you're not walking the way you're, you're not checking the boxes. You, you look a little different than, than what I think you need to. And I think this has a potential to, you know, really challenge us who are recovering fundamentalists to say, you know, I need to love that person like Jesus loved them. And what if I'm the one hindering them from coming to know him? And, you know, really just check your heart. I, I don't know how to put that in words. Maybe one of y'all could word that better um, if you know what, what I'm even trying to say. Uh, but I think there's a there's that desire to to hear this and to, to love people like Jesus. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Just love yeah. people like Jesus loves people. He, he, yeah. And he loved the homosexuals. Jesus you know, he, was he, full of grace and truth. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yep. And and if you're a pastor listening to this and you fight that struggle to stand up because it's easy to preach against homosexuality, mm -hmm. maybe preach the gospel and show the love of Jesus and see yeah. what change comes versus just um, condemning them to hell because Jesus yeah. died for them. He loves them. And then for those that are struggling with this, you've heard the gospel the, the, the choice is yours. Yeah. Say yes to him. Yeah. And, and as a pastor, I feel like the tradition we grew up in was very quick to condemn homosexuality. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm not the judge. I, I yeah. believe what the Bible says. I believe it's a sin, but uh, I, I'm also a sinner. So I don't yeah. want to fall in the camp of condemning sinners. I can condemn the sin, but I don't want to condemn people that Jesus came to save. But then there's the other camp that wants me to condone that sin. Mm, yeah. And say, it's okay. It's not a sin. You can still be a pastor. You can still be saved. You can still be a gay Christian. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to condone that sin because again, I'm not the judge. I have to say what God says. God That's defines it. what's right and what's wrong. So, but I think there is a third, there's, there's a middle road here and that is compassion. Yeah, I can show compassion it. to sinners. Like you're saying, JC, love sinners like Jesus. The Bible tells yeah. us in John 3, 
17, I think it is, that they are already condemned. Yeah. They know their conscience condemns them. Romans 1 says they're without excuse. They know there's a God. They know they're mm. going to stand before him one day. They're already condemned. Offer them the hope of the gospel because Jesus came and died and shed his blood and was resurrected to save them. If I can just make one final statement, and this will be it for me. Um, you know, there was a time when you could talk about homosexuality and it was that person out there somewhere. Yeah. Right. But now as we're talking about this, everyone has that child mm -hmm. or that brother or that sister or that family member or that person they work with who's really nice and they really like them and or that person in the community. You know, guys, this is so prominent now that it's no longer just this faceless thing that we talk about, but the moment we talk about it, people automatically picture the image of the person they know who lives this lifestyle. And I just want to tell everybody, affection doesn't mean approval. That's it. You no. can have affection for someone and show affection to someone and not give them affirmation in their sin. If you are a Christian, be really careful mm. about that, mm. that you love the person, but that you don't affirm their sin. Mm. That's, that's them understanding that God loves us while radically disapproving of our sin. Mm. And to the parents who have a child who has let you know that they're now gay or lesbian and, and you're wondering what to do, you need to love them like the prodigal father loved his son. He was willing to shame himself. You know, guys, it was considered a shame in that culture for an older man to run or an older man to lift up his robe because it exposed his legs. And the father running out to his son, that was an act of humiliation. The father humiliated himself. And then he covered his, his sinful son because if you remember in Deuteronomy, the community had the right to stone that son to death. And we need to remember that on the cross of, of Calvary, Jesus was put to an open shame mm. so that he could cover sinners from the wrath of God. And you need to That's love good. them accordingly. Yeah. That's good. Fellas, I feel pretty good about what we, what we've shared. Uh, mm. And I'm with you, JC. My heart's heavy, but man, yeah. the grace of God is greater than our sin. Uh, yeah, I, I pray is. that someone hears hope. I pray that someone uh, resists the urge to think that we're bashing anybody. Man, we're not. We, we, when we stand on what God says, we're not bashing anyone. We're, we're yeah. saying that this is the truth. This is the reality that we live in. Mm -hmm. And you find freedom when you admit that, but we do love and we do want to see people find, find forgiveness. And we're not better than anyone out there. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> we're not, not better than any other category of sinners. And, uh, we, we want you to know that, that we are preachers of the gospel, that we have the good news and we just want to share it with everybody. I know it's hard to hear if you struggle with this sin, what we've said today is hard to hear. And, yeah. uh, I, I pray that that you would turn to Christ. And I also pray that some preachers that have been yeah. bashing gay people That's in, it. in the name of Jesus, they're, they're, uh, gospel terrorists. They claim Stop. to be preaching the gospel Amen. and they're, 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 uh, bullies in the pulpit. I pray that you'll repent and I pray that Amen. you'll start weeping when you preach about yeah. homosexualities. And I pray you'll go knock on doors and go down and visit people and invite them to, to, have a relationship with Christ, the only relationship that can ever satisfy them. Amen. JC, would you, Ooh. would you close us in prayer, man? I, I love your heart. And I just watched you as we were doing, you know, doing this uh, episode and it's just, like you said, there's a heaviness there and I know yeah. your compassion and your love for people. And uh, I just love it. If you'd, you close us out in prayer. Father, we love you. God, we thank you that when we were, just lost in the the pit of our sin mm. uh, that separates us from you. 
God, that your mercy and your grace was extended to us. And uh, God, I'm sorry that uh, your church, man, we just, we have pushed so many people away from you because it doesn't fit our standard or it doesn't fit our mold or how we think it should look. And God, forgive us for that. God, I pray tonight for the one that's listening to this, God, that their sin would be so uh, in front of them, the way that they're living uh, would just make them, as Jackie Hill Perry said, just sick and realize that uh, I need a good Savior to get rid of this sin in my life. And God, that you will let them know that you love them, that you care for them, um, that they are not their choices, uh, but you died. And you sent your son to die for them and that they can find forgiveness and hope and newness of life uh, by turning from that sin to you. And God, I pray uh, for the one that is sitting in silence right now, listening to this, their heart is beating. They're they're sweaty. They they feel terrible because they they know that um, <laughs> seeking out accountability and repentance. There's a there's a whole list of things that could happen. Mm. Uh, but God, I pray, I pray that you give them strength to step out from amongst the 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 nastiness of that sin and to find hope. And God, the voice of the enemy is going to be so loud, uh, telling them and filling their minds with all kinds of, here's what's going to happen if you, uh, if you leave this. Here's what's going to happen if you uh, start telling folks where you're struggling. God, I pray that you're, you silence those voices and that your grace and your mercy and your love will be so loud uh, and it just cast out all fear and a God that you really do rescue and redeem and set free some folks who are struggling with this sin. God, I pray um, that as a result of our feeble efforts of talking to a microphone and just sharing our heart, um, that you help some folks find hope mm -hmm. and life everlasting. Yeah. Satan wants to steal our joy. He wants to kill our witness. He wants to destroy our life. But you came that we could have life more abundantly, life everlasting, a better life than we've ever imagined right now. And I pray for many to go from death to life, to get rid of the thing that's keeping them from moving forward and give them ultimate joy, give them a satisfaction that they can't find in anything else. God, I love you. And thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for not leaving us helpless and hopeless, but rescuing us. And I pray that we will continually, daily, die to self and give you control of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Fellas, I'm thankful for pastors like you who aren't scared to stand up and speak the truth. And pastors like you who have a heart to see the lost saved. And uh, that's just... I'm encouraged by what I've heard from you tonight. Thank you. Amen. I feel the same. It's been a good week, and uh, thanks for being here with us. Um, if you'd like to be a sponsor, you can go to recoveringfundamentalist.org, click on the Sponsor tab, and uh, we would love for you to be part of the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Mm -hmm. Guys, I love you. I appreciate you, you too, and, uh, and I hope you have a great week. Be sweet. Love you guys. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Be sure to stop by our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, go to our website, recoveringfundamentalist.org. That's recoveringfundamentalist.org. There you can find Recovering Fundamentalist swag. You can get your t-shirts and hats. You can join our ex-fundy community. See where we're going to be having some meetups. It's the recoveringfundamentalist.org. Be sure to join us next time for the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. <laughs>